From an ancient Etruscan site outside of Padua, archaeologists unearthed a mysterious stone. Dating from before 500 BC, the stone was carved with an amazing symmetry. It had 12 identical faces. Each face was made of five edges of the same length and five angles of the same size. And each face was rotated from its adjoining faces by the same angle. The symmetry and harmony of this stone could be no accident. But why would someone create such an object? What would draw someone to even conceive of such a thing? Although the purpose of the stone is shrouded in mystery, perhaps the inspiration for carving it came from observing how nature itself constructs shapes in rocks. The shape of crystals is determined by their atomic building blocks. In a grain of everyday table salt, we can see a crystal that looks like a cube. The molecules that form salt consist of one sodium atom joined to one chlorine atom. When these molecules pack themselves together, they are able to fit perfectly next to one another like pieces of a puzzle. The way the molecules assemble creates no gaps between them, so they fill the least amount of space. The repeated pattern forms a particular structure. When we see the shape of a salt crystal, we are looking at the resulting pattern of billions of molecules packed together. This is just one pattern in the many ways in which crystals can form. If we look at how carbon atoms assemble to form a diamond crystal, we can see a different pattern in the way the crystal is packed. The carbon atoms tend to structure themselves in a pattern that fills space differently. The resulting crystal that forms from this structure is a shape we call an octahedron. These crystals have the same kind of structure as the ancient Etruscan stone. Each face of the solid is the same regular polygon. Each face is made of edges of the same length, angles of the same size, and is rotated from adjoining faces by the same angle. This kind of solid reveals a perfect mathematical symmetry and harmony. Such geometric beauty was the foundation for the beliefs of the mystical Pythagorean school founded in ancient Greece around 550 BC. The Pythagorean school looked for the beauty in numbers and shapes and saw that harmony as a way to understand nature. They discovered and studied the convex solid shapes that could be constructed with the identical faces of regular polygons. All in all, there are five, and only five. The four-sided tetrahedron, the six-sided cube or hexahedron, the eight-sided octahedron, the 12-sided dodecahedron, and the 20-sided icosahedron. The ancient Greeks studied not only the properties of each solid, but also the relationships that exist between them and found some interesting connections. For instance, when they marked the center of each face of a cube and put a vertex point there, they could connect those points with edges and faces to create an octahedron. Similarly, if they found the midpoint of every face in an octahedron and put a vertex point there, they could connect those points to create a cube. Because of this relationship, the cube and the octahedron are considered dual solids. The dodecahedron also has a dual with the icosahedron. The vertices of a dodecahedron will fit in perfectly along the midpoint of the faces of an icosahedron. And the vertices of an icosahedron will fit in perfectly along the midpoint of the faces of a dodecahedron. The tetrahedron is its own dual solid, since connecting the midpoints of the faces of a tetrahedron will create another tetrahedron. Even though the Pythagoreans studied these solids, we typically refer to them not by Pythagoras' name, but by the name of the philosopher Plato, who continued to study their intriguing properties. Since Plato lived about 2,000 years before René Descartes developed Cartesian coordinates to describe solid objects, Plato had to find another method for measuring them. He discovered that he could use the tool of the Pythagorean theorem that describes the ratios of lengths in right triangles. If he could describe the solids in terms of right triangles, then the theorem could be used to supply the measurements he wanted. 
Plato didn't think of each face of a tetrahedron as being an equilateral triangle, but six right triangles. The tetrahedron was made of 24 right triangles, the octahedron of 48 right triangles, and the icosahedron was made of 120 right triangles. Not only was this an excellent measuring tool to describe the proportions in these solids, but it also helped infuse them with the beauty the Greeks found in the Pythagorean theorem. Plato himself didn't use the name platonic solids that we use today, but called them the cosmic bodies. Because of the perfect beauty he saw in them, he reasoned that these regular solids represented the four elements, the building blocks of all matter. He believed that the tetrahedron represented fire, the cube represented earth, the icosahedron represented water, and the octahedron represented air. Representing the universe, or the fifth element, quintessence, was the dodecahedron. This was, in effect, the first attempt at a periodic table of elements. Plato believed that one could study the relationships between these solids to understand chemical reactions. Everything in existence was made of combinations of these four elements. If the cosmic bodies were constructed of triangles, then everything else must also be constructed of these triangles. In this way, Plato saw that conceptually, everything could be triangulated. The nature of something, therefore, depended on the triangles that constructed it. Plato wrote a book titled Timaeus, in which he outlined this unified theory of matter. As an example, he demonstrated how triangles could describe the aging process in people. He reasoned that the frame of a young person is made of fresh new triangles. The connections in these new triangles are strong. When a young person consumes food, the triangles in his body are stronger than the weaker triangles in the food. Therefore, he can easily digest them. His body then assimilates the power of those triangles and grows. In older people, the structure of their triangles has become weaker over time. When they consume food, their weaker triangles are not able to break down the triangles in the food. They are less able to assimilate the strength of the triangles in food, so they begin to waste away. The idea of eating triangles seems rather silly, but Plato's cosmic view was among the first ways in which people saw mathematics and geometry as a way to explain everything in their world. If the environment around them was made of triangles, then they could measure the triangles and therefore measure the environment. If they could measure it, they could begin to understand it in terms of logic and reason. Starting from triangles, mathematicians created more tools for measuring their environment. The most important compilation of these geometric tools was made by Euclid. He wrote The Elements of Geometry, which brought together all the geometric knowledge of the Greeks and has been the most influential mathematical book in history. In the last chapter of The Elements, he addresses the platonic solids and how they work with spheres. Each of the solids has a specific center point. This means that a sphere can be created with the same center so that it touches each of the vertices of the solid. Or, a smaller sphere can be drawn that touches the midpoint of each face. It was the relationship of the platonic solids with spheres that inspired the astronomer Johannes Kepler. For centuries, astronomers watched the sun, moon, planets, and stars travel through the sky and strove to create a model of how all the heavenly bodies were moving. Numerous people proposed countless ideas. For the most part, models were inspired less by factual observations than they were by philosophy. The heavens were seen as being perfect, therefore the model of their structure must somehow be perfect as well. In 1595, Kepler had the idea to try and employ the perfect beauty in the platonic solids as an underlying structure to the heavens. He pictured the orbits of the Earth, the other planets, and the stars as being confined to imaginary crystalline spheres, concentrically nested one inside the other with the Sun at the center. He saw the platonic solids as providing the proportions for how the spheres were spaced apart. On the innermost sphere was the orbit of the planet Mercury. That sphere was nested inside an octahedron. 
Touching the outside of that octahedron was another sphere that held the orbit of Venus. This sphere was contained inside an icosahedron and held the orbit of the Earth. A dodecahedron contained that sphere, and the pattern continued with a tetrahedron containing the sphere of Jupiter's orbit, and a cube containing Saturn's orbit, and holding out the outer sphere of the stars. By using Plato's cosmic bodies, this model contained a divine beauty that was appropriate enough for something as majestic as the solar system. But there was only one problem. His model didn't match the observed motions of the planets in the night sky. The data that shattered Kepler's model was being collected by the ever-improving technology of the telescope. Ironically enough, it would be the telescope itself that gave Kepler not only the data, but the real inspiration he needed. Telescopes rely on the optical properties of lenses and mirrors. The shape of these lenses and mirrors are based on curves that can be created by slicing cones. If a plane intersects a cone, it will slice through the surface in one of several ways. It will create a hyperbola, a parabola, an ellipse, or a circle. Kepler took the ellipse and tried to see if he could use it to describe the motion of the planets. Miraculously, it worked perfectly and matched the data collected by telescopes. He went on to develop three laws that could describe the position and speed of how the planets move. Although Kepler had accurately found the way that the planets move, he was unable to describe why they move this way. Part of the challenge was that the factors involved couldn't be described with the mathematical tools that were available at the time. The speed of a planet and its distance from the Sun are constantly changing. The motion of the planets present changing values, and Kepler's math was unable to aim at these moving targets. The same type of problem presented itself not just in the heavens, but also in things a bit less celestial. Things like wine barrels. When wine vendors needed to measure the volume of their barrels, they were unable to create a formula that would describe the curving shape. There was no way to say the barrel had a certain radius because the radius was constantly changing from thinner at the top to thicker in the middle to thinner again at the bottom. Traditionally, winemakers simply guessed. They picked a radius for the barrel somewhere in the middle and estimated that the barrel's volume was a cylinder with that radius. You can imagine that for a man like Kepler, such mathematical sloppiness was quite disturbing. Kepler wanted to find a better solution. He started by using not just one cylinder to define the barrel, but several smaller ones. These smaller cylinders, when added together, would give a better approximation of the volume. Kepler found that the shorter the cylinders were, the more he could fit into the barrel, and their sum would grow closer and closer to the actual curved volume. As the height of the cylinders approached zero, Kepler realized that he would be able to capture the elusive volume of the barrel. Kepler wasn't the only one who measured shapes by breaking them into pieces that were shrinking to zero in size. Cavalieri created similar ways of breaking things into infinitesimally small parts and summing up the pieces. Eventually, to better accomplish this task, calculus was created independently by the mathematicians Newton and Leibniz. Calculus became an entirely new way of looking at the mathematical world. It was able to take the continuously changing data on a curve and measure its parts in terms of infinitesimally small distances. Measuring with an infinite number of zeros isn't something that one can do with a ruler, but calculus gives us a mathematical window to take logic beyond what we can achieve with physical measuring tools. Up until then, mathematicians couldn't make this leap they had to work with the specific bits of data they could measure. For the platonic solids or other angular objects, they could identify the specific points in space that were connected by edges and faces. Being able to describe something completely with a limited amount of information is called discrete measurement. With discrete measurement, points are located at specific locations in space and the distances between them are connected with straight lines. The direction of the overall line will only change at the specific points. This means that a simple discrete line will never be able to measure the length of a curve. 
Even if the points were located very close together, the straight lines between them would still take shortcuts across the curve. The only way to reproduce the correct length is to abandon discrete measurement and use calculus to envision the points on the line as being separated by zero distance. The same principles apply to surfaces. The area of a smoothly curved surface can be approximated with a discrete mesh. The discrete points are now connected by straight lines and flat planes. Adding in more points to a mesh can give a better approximation, but the flat planes will never reproduce the curved area. To do this, one must again abandon the discrete and turn to calculus. However, just because a mesh is crunched so that its points are separated by zero distance doesn't necessarily mean that it will accurately estimate a curved shape. For instance, we can start with a cylinder again and make a rough approximation of the surface area with a polygonal mesh made of triangles called a Schwartz lantern. This mesh is obviously too rough and we will need to add more sample points to get a better approximation. There are two ways we can increase the amount of samples in this polygonal mesh. We can increase the number of triangles around the cylinder or the number of triangles down the height of the cylinder. Increasing the triangles around the cylinder will smooth out the mesh and we will eventually get an accurate calculation of the surface area. However, if we increase the number of triangles along the height of the cylinder, the mesh begins to zigzag. Adding more triangles vertically causes the mesh to crinkle more and more as it folds up like an accordion. In this way, the surface area actually becomes larger and larger and extends infinitely past the area of the original cylinder. This may appear obvious since we can see the folds developing. But when we increase the number of triangles vertically, as well as the number of triangles around at the same rate, we appear to get a correct approximation. However, the appearance is misleading because we still have created folds like before. Although the crinkles are now quite small, they are still present. Depending on how we increase the resolution, the resulting estimation might look accurate, but could give us a value anywhere between the actual area of the cylinder and infinity. Even if a mesh appears to give us a good approximation, we have to know its limiting behavior. Infinitely small meshes don't necessarily give us correct answers. It seems that in a world of continuously changing values, discrete measurement is only able to provide broken, chunky samples. So what good is discrete measurement at all? Why would mathematicians ever want to employ a discrete model to understand something that is infinitely changing? Discrete math, this seemingly oversimplified view of the world, got its biggest boost from, oddly enough, the invention of the most advanced calculation tool, the computer. Computers, with all their power, can only think about objects in terms of finite sets of numbers. The infinite number of data points on a curve can't all be crammed into a computer, no matter how large its memory. This means that computers must work in discrete terms. With the new tool of the computer, engineers could construct a building in the digital world and test to see how structurally sound it was without the expense and danger of testing it in the real world. The problem was, the older computers couldn't handle so much data at once. These early computer simulations could only deal with a small, finite number of points. Therefore, engineers had to resurrect the discrete way of describing the world. As computers improved and could handle more data, the engineers were able to make more accurate models. They defined their structures with more points, and they also switched from using rectangles to using triangles. This, of course, wasn't the first time that people envisioned their world as being constructed entirely of triangles. The smaller the triangles in the simulations, the more accurate results they could produce. The meshes in these simulations were small, but they weren't trying to shrink to zero in size. The results provided by the models could accurately simulate dynamic forces such as the bending stress of building materials. This work of engineers attracted the attention of mathematicians. Mathematicians had to reconsider the usefulness of discrete approximations.
From what they could see in these dynamic simulations, perhaps discrete tools could provide a valid way of describing complex phenomena. The first challenge was to see how the seemingly awkward corners created by discrete geometry could accurately describe something that was curving. To deal with this issue, we must first define what is meant by curvature. If we have a curve, we can define its curvature using a perpendicular pointing arrow. The arrow runs along the length of the curve, and as it moves, its orientation will change. We can look at how the orientation of the arrow changes as a way of measuring how much the path has curved. By tracing off an arc in a circle, we can keep track of the arrow's orientation. The more the arrow rotates as it travels from one side of the curve to the other, the greater the amount of curvature. How would this approach work for a discrete line that isn't continuously curved but has sharp corners? When the perpendicular arrow moves along a discrete line, its orientation won't change until it gets to a corner. At that point, it will turn sharply and continue in a new direction. The total angle that the arrow sweeps can be considered the curvature of this discrete shape. As the curvature changes, the angles the arrow would sweep change along with it. If the line closes to make a polygon, we can see that its curvature is a full 360 degrees. The overall curvature will not change, even as points on the polygon are moved. The individual angles might change, but their sum remains the same. If we increase the number of edges in the polygon, we create more angles. At each of these points, the perpendicular arrow sweeps out a smaller angle. Even though there are more angles, the total sum that they sweep is the same. As the number of edges grows larger, the shape begins to look smoother, yet the total curvature remains unchanged. If we increase to an infinite number of faces on the polygon, we now have a continuously curving shape. Now, there are no more individual angles to add together, but we still know how the curvature will work. The discrete model tells us that even as points on the curved shape are moved about, the overall curvature will remain the same. From the discrete shape, we were able to learn something about the properties of the smooth shape. We can even take this idea a step further and see how it works in three-dimensional space. If we have a surface consisting of two planes that share an edge, we can use an arrow that will always point perpendicular to the surface. No matter where we move the arrow on the plane, it will always have the same orientation until we bring it to the angled edge. At that point, it will flip over to the other plane. That flip of the arrow can be used to trace out an arc on a sphere. The greater the angle between the two planes, the longer the arc on the sphere. The length of the arc is not affected by the size or shape of the planes. The planes can be of any shape and it will not affect the orientation of the arrows. All that matters is the angle at which they meet. We can reshape the planes and add in a third one. The shape now has three angled edges. As the arrow sweeps over these edges, it traces out a triangular patch on the sphere. The curvature of the shape is determined by the area of this patch. Describing curvature in this way gives us what we call Gauss curvature. As the shape flattens and has less Gauss curvature, the patch grows smaller. And as the shape takes on more Gauss curvature, the patch gets larger on the sphere. While Gauss curvature is useful, it might not give us all of the information we need. For instance, a flat plane has no Gauss curvature. If we were to roll it to create a cylinder, a perpendicular arrow would sweep out a complete circle on the sphere, but it would not create a patch. No patch means there is no surface area covered on the sphere, and no surface area means that the cylinder will have no Gauss curvature. But we can see that the cylinder does curve. To describe how the cylinder is curving, we need another way to describe curvature. To do this, we think of how the flat plane had to curl up its points to create a cylinder. This is called tension. 
As a discrete line gains more curvature, we can see the center point is being pulled away from the points around it. If we think of the line as something that wants to snap back, like a rubber band, we can see that the more the line is forced to bend, the more tension must be exerted on it. If we think of curvature in terms of tension, we can see the inner vertex as something that is being pulled back by the tug of the adjacent edges. The length and orientation of those edges will affect the tension. We can apply the idea of tension to three-dimensional meshes as well. In this case, a vertex is no longer being pulled by adjacent edges, but by its adjacent faces in the mesh. The shape and orientation of each face will dictate the amount of pull that it exerts on a vertex. Although discrete models and continuously curving models are two completely different things, there are some ways to bridge the gap between them. We can create a process called subdivision to smooth out the hard angles of something that is discrete. For instance, with a discrete line, we can take each of the segments, divide them into parts, and use the division marks to cut off the hard angles. Cutting off the corners means that none of the new angles bend as sharply. Also, we have created more segments in our line. We can repeat the process in each of the new segments and cut off the corners again. If we continue this process, we eventually end up with a smooth curve that is determined only by a few points. We can see that if we remember the process that made the line smooth, we can control the curve by moving just the points on the original discrete line. The same principle can apply to three-dimensional objects as well. Instead of cutting off segments of line, we can trim chunks off of a solid shape. With divisions of the edges and faces, we define which chunks need to be removed. Repeating the trimming can produce a smooth shape from a simple, discrete mesh. If we keep in mind the process that we used, we can take the original points on the polygonal mesh and use them to remodel the smooth shape. This way, we can create complex curving shapes by starting with a polygonal mesh and running a process to smooth out the facets. From something sharp and angular, we can make something smooth and organic. Again, the points on the original mesh can be used to control the seemingly infinite points on the smooth surface. When we use discrete meshes to describe something that contains both smooth curves and hard angles, sometimes we can be presented with the challenge of managing the data to serve both purposes. A 3D computer scanner can locate where a point on an object is located in 3D space. When a scanner samples points all over an object, the points can be assembled together into a mesh, providing a complete digital model of the object. However, there is a certain level of imperfection in the scanning process, so that tiny errors are made in locating each point. These errors may be small, but when we see the points assembled together, the mesh can appear jagged or noisy. Since the points are no longer part of a physical object, but just mathematical points in space, we can use mathematical tools to smooth them out. One method we can use is to find the tension forces pulling on a point from the surrounding triangles. We take those tension forces, add them together, and move the point in that direction. This will reduce the total tension and therefore the curvature. Edges that were stretched out become shorter, and edges that were pressed together become longer. Lowering the tension around a point will smooth out the mesh. However, sometimes this might not provide the result we want. The noise in the mesh will be smoothed out, as well as any sharp edges or corners that we would want to keep. 
What we need is a smoothing process that can smooth out just the noise in the model, but keep the hard edges that we want to remain crisp. When we reduced the tension before, we were considering each edge around a point. In the case of our model, we only want to smooth the edges that define flat or smoothly curving areas and not affect the edges that define a corner or a sharp edge of the model. To do this, we need to find the areas in the model that hold more curvature. Seeing curvature in terms of tension, we find places that have high tension and know that they are defining an edge or a corner. In areas that hold little curvature, we sample all the edges around a point equally. In areas that hold high curvature, our smoothing should average only the lengths of edges that run along the curvature, and not in opposite directions that would result in smoothing out a corner. In our model, we smooth uniformly in areas of low curvature, and in areas of high curvature, we only smooth the edges that run along the direction of the curvature. The resulting digital model is smoothed and yet remains sharp where we want it, thus eliminating the noise and creating an accurate reproduction of the original. We can build polygonal models which have different levels of curvature or tension spread throughout them. But there are some models that require that the tension be spread uniformly throughout such as bubbles. If we take a loop of wire and cover it with a soap film, we can see the soap stretching to create a flat surface. The soap has an elastic quality and will always stretch to the smallest surface possible. We call a surface which distributes its tension evenly optimal. Looking at the soap on a microscopic level, we can see the soap molecules pulling at each other. We can think of the molecules as points on a mesh. If we move one molecule away from its neighbors, we create a high level of tension in one location. The surrounding molecules would rearrange themselves to spread their curvature evenly among them. If we blow air under the soap film, we are adding pressure that will force the soap molecules apart. If we describe the bubble with a polygonal mesh, we can see that the air adds tension, causing the mesh to stretch. Between the faces on the mesh, there is tension pulling inward. The inward tension in the mesh is in balance with the outward pressure of the air. Eventually, when we blow in enough air, the bubble may slip off of the hoop, and we see that the bubble becomes a perfect sphere. Since we're used to seeing only spherical bubbles, this really isn't all that surprising. But we need to ask, why can't we make bubbles of other shapes? If we start with a square loop and blow in air, what is to stop the bubble from coming out a cube? In the scanned model, we saw that different parts of the mesh had different degrees of curvature. Sharp corners held high curvature, and flat areas, no curvature. If we put a mesh over our cubical bubble, we can see that the curvature in the cube is also spread unevenly. Along the faces of the cube, there is no tension, since all the tension is being held along the edges and corners. The problem is, the soap film will not allow the tension to concentrate in one place more than another. The elasticity in the soap molecules wants to spread out the tension as evenly as possible, so any hard edges from the square loop would immediately smooth out. It's this smoothing of tension that will make bubbles as round as possible. No matter how we try to force bubbles into strange shapes, the tension will always spread evenly over the surface. However, if we know how tension works in discrete meshes, we can follow the rules of how bubbles work and still create some incredible shapes. In our original spherical bubble, we can see that the soap film is at rest. The pressure inside the bubble is exerting some force against the base plane. This pressure is balanced out by the tension of the bubble as it touches the wire. If we add in another guide wire, we see the same effect. The pressure exerted against the second plane is in balance with the tension around the wire. Now that the bubble is constrained by these two wires, we can reshape it by pulling and pushing the wires. Or we can reshape it if we add in air or reduce the amount of air in the bubble. As we squeeze and stretch the bubble, the bubble's tension against the wires changes. 
When the bubble is pulled outwards, the tension it holds against the guide wires is pulling inwards. The bubble is wanting to go back to its original spherical shape and therefore is pulling inwards against the guide wires. When the bubble is squeezed inwards, the tension it holds against the guide wires is now pushing outwards. To return to its spherical shape, the bubble wants to push outwards against the wires. We can take these different bubble shapes and carefully fit them together like pieces of a puzzle. We can fit a pulling bubble between two at-rest spherical bubbles. When these parts come together, the result is a net pulling force which pulls the bubble into a sphere. We can try to avoid letting the bubble collapse into a sphere by linking together more pieces to create a circular chain. However, the pulling bubbles still work to collapse the bubble into a sphere. What is needed is some sort of pushing force to keep the pulling bubbles in check. The squeezed bubble we made before has a pushing force since its tension is directed outwards. If we take two of our pushing bubbles, fit them together, and slice off the edges, we have not affected the overall pushing force it exerts. However, we have now created a bubble that has intersecting loops that could not be created out of soap. Our model has now left the realm of reality and is now a purely mathematical idea. In our ring of pulling bubbles, we can fit in our pushing segments like spokes on a wheel. We now have pulling forces being kept in check by pushing forces. If we carefully adjust the strength of the forces, we can make a strange looking bubble that actually is in balance. Such a bubble, called a pentasurface, is an amazingly complex construction. It can't be made out of actual soap, but only out of mathematics. And, as complex as it is, this experimental bubble surface can currently only be conceived of with discrete meshes. The current state of calculus has not yet been able to provide theoretical proof of the existence of the pentasurface. Although calculus has been able to prove the existence of other closed bubble shapes, such bubbles as the pentasurface are amazing examples of the power of discrete geometry. Discrete surfaces see the world in terms of specific bits of data. When mathematicians first conceived of calculus, it was a way in which they could overcome the shortcomings provided by the limited view of discrete meshes. However, they soon found that calculus itself has limitations. And ultimately, they found that often, the best solution is to return to the simplicity and harmony of discrete meshes.